Hey everyone, it's Chris Brown of the Crossboard Interviews with Chris Brown. Welcome back to another great week of shows, and today we are re-releasing our third most popular show of 2022. This episode comes from us back in April of this year, where we sat down, we tried to sit down with many of the candidates who are running for nominations from across different parties. Diane Batten is running, was running, I should say, for the nomination in Calgary, Acadia for the Alberta NDP. We sat down with her and talked about her duty to serve, her desire to continue uh, moving the province forward, and what she was hearing at that time from the people of Calgary, Acadia. So here is our third most popular episode of 2022 with the, on the cross-border interviews with Chris Brown. Welcome back to the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I'm your host, Christopher Brown. And today we have the A, I should say A, uh, candidate for the nomination in Calgary, Acadia for the Alberta NDP. I got that right. Diana Batten. <laughs> Diana, thank you so much for doing this. This is an honor and a pleasure. And I'm looking forward to our conversation about yourself, the party, and what you're hearing at the doorsteps in Calgary, Acadia. Perfect. Thanks so much, Chris. It's great to be here. So uh, you, you just told me you've listened to a past interview with mine. So I know you know what the first question is going to be coming out of my mouth here. And that is, yeah. where does your sense of duty to serve come from? Well, and I, I appreciate this question, Chris, both in terms of I had, I knew it was coming. So I've given it some thought um, because honestly, there are so many, uh, you know, so many different things that have led me to this place. So I'll try to narrow it down for us. <laughs> um, right. Um, one is that honestly, I'm one of those bizarre people in this world who are just born with the strange need to support and as my younger brother might describe it as smother, um, support others, right? So uh, weird things like when I was five or six, I made lunches, just independently made lunches for my entire family. I come, I have three siblings and two parents and, you know, I would, like what six-year-old makes lunches for their family? Like it's, it's a little, it was a little weird. Anywho, but, and I loved it. And I can't speak to the nutritional uh, value of these lunches, but you know, I made them. <laughs> um, and I was, you know, and I was that, that, you know, in high school at a party where people were, you know, maybe, um, you know, not, you know, they fell asleep somewhere. I was that person who went around and like pu pushed them into like the recovery position, right? So they wouldn't, potentially aspirate on their own emesis type deal. So anyway, so it's, so what I'm saying is that I have this duty has come from, you know, from the beginning in terms of what more recently has brought me here. Um, I did live in the United States for almost a decade. I spent most of my twenties there. Um, and I saw firsthand kind of the effects of privatized healthcare and privatized education. Um, I, myself, I was super fortunate. I had very good insurance when I lived down there. Um, however, it created such a, a huge gap for a lot of people to fall through. Um, I had, I was, you know, I'm born and raised in Saskatchewan. And uh, so, and all of my, honestly, my, from like 91 to 2007, we were NDP. We were, and so during those formative years, that's what the government was in my province, right? And so I became very accustomed to these social programs and uh, to that support being there. And so living in the United States and I guess really getting that reality check that this is not, you know, we were so fortunate in Canada to have these these supports. Um, it just, yeah, it it wasn't it wasn't the world that I wanted to grow up in. How's that? Or it wasn't the environment that I felt was best um, for society. If that makes sense. It does, and there are many ways that you can give back, though, to your community, to your family, to your friends, to your neighborhood, to your province, to your country. You've chosen the political route this time. You've chosen in 2022, when you've announced, in 2023, if there's an election, potentially, we don't know when that election might be because there's speculation it might be earlier. 
but election laws say 2023. So let's go on the assumption that Jason Kenney doesn't call this till 2023. You have announced that you were running for the nomination for Calgary Acadia. Um, I guess the very first question that has to be asked is, why now? What, what about 2023 and what's going on in the political realm today made you decide it's time to get in, it's time to do this? So I would have to say, and this is the, so it's why now is that last summer, like many of us, I just hit a point where the world doesn't make sense, right? Where it was, I didn't trust anyone anymore, right? I was receiving completely conflicting information from my, you know, employers, the government, Alberta Health, whatever it was. Um, and then of course, any private research I was doing on my own, things weren't adding up. Um, and I felt like there wasn't, my voice wasn't being heard, healthcare workers' voices were not being heard, educators' voices were not being heard. Um, and I just really felt that it was time to step up and do something. Now, I will not take full credit for it. You know, it wasn't something I woke up one day and was like, ooh, I should become a politician. No, 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 no. It is, <laughs> it's, it's nothing that, that straightforward. Um, honestly, I, will, I, I credit my partner for it. He basically saw that I was kind of sulking around and I do much better when I'm, when I'm actually doing something, right? And so um, with his you know, strong suggestion, I I'd contacted the NDP and said, hey, like I'm interested in volunteering. What are the needs? How do I get involved? And of course, part of that was, where do I redirect all of this frustration and this disappointment? How do I, um, you know, selfishly just make it better for myself? <laughs> and by connecting with these amazing people, like it was just, it had been so long since I had been in a, you know, a room, <laughs> Zoom meeting with everyone with the same goal, right? We had the same concerns. We had the same, we saw the same people being left behind, right? And we saw more and more Albertans becoming those people. And so it was just, it was so incredibly motivating to hear those shared concerns, right? And that we were yeah, working towards the same goal. And so after that call, I was like, this is great. You know, there's a number of things I could uh, get involved with and that's awesome. And one of the things on the list was, you know, candidacy. And my partner was like, well, why don't you become a candidate? And I was like, oh, no, like that's crazy talk. I couldn't do this. Um, and so I, you know, I thought about it. I fortunately have, um, I have some, some family who's been in politics. So I reached out and just asked the very blunt question of what is the actual life of an MLA? right? Tell me the good and the bad. Tell me, you know, am I going to get frustrated because I can't move things through? Is this actually a solution for me, right? And can, you know, is, is my experience valuable inside this realm, right? Because it's, I don't know about, I mean, I haven't been involved in politics my whole life, right? This was a, this is a new way I'm, I'm branching out. And so I, you know, got the, the good, the bad and the ugly um, and had some really tough conversations conversations with my partner and with my family um, and in touch with a couple different members of the party. And I was asked, you know, Sarah Hoffman asked me, I want you to run. And I said, okay. <laughs> and, and it snowballed from there. Um, so yeah, it's, I mean, it came out of a place of frustration, but Chris, I, it has been so amazing. Like I say this, I don't, I, I feel like I say this in every single conversation I have with people, which is that Every time I'm door knocking, every time I have calls, every time I'm involved in any of this, uh, any of our, our, the NDP activities, it is so, it is so good for my soul, right? And I hope that I can share that, right? That I can, that those conversations aren't just good for my soul, but are also good for those are, who are engaging that conversation. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my why your, now. Your journey to now and why now, but yeah. You've talked in the first 10 minutes of the interview that we've done so far about your family uh, history with the NDP, with the uh, yeah. uh, being in a province that was heavily NDP, being down in the States. Um, it, it leads to the question though, why the NDP? What about the NDP is your reason for being there? Because I like hearing the answer from a lot of the candidates. Because they're always different, right? There's always an issue that you feel strongly about that you resonate with the party that you're running for. So for you, what is that issue? And what is the reason behind your, your, your the real, not the real reason, but what is the reason behind going towards and running for the NDP in this election? Big question, Chris. <laughs> 
We um, ask the big questions for the big do, answers on the show. <laughs> <laughs> no, I appreciate it. I think it's, I think it's good. Um, so why the NDP? Why the Alberta NDP? Um, honestly, when I look at the values, right? When I, when I think about what's important to me, um, and the big thing that's important to me, people are important to me and not a small group of them, but all people, right? Um, again, I was raised in a province where the NDP values, and, and granted, you know, they're a little different between province to province, um, you know, federally versus provincially, but at the end of the day, it is about creating a society that supports each other, regardless if you are, you know, if you, if you work in the high towers, um, you know, in Calgary, or if you live beneath them, right? Uh, it, we, life matters. And so nursing really uh, grew that in me, really made it um, an important consideration, which sounds strange. Um, but honestly, when I think about what nursing has done, um, like I, I joke that in my 20s, I was a scientist, my 30s, um, I was, you know, or I am a registered nurse. And then my 40s, I'm like, yeah, I'm a politician. Okay, here we go. <laughs> um, <laughs> which, which seems like a bit of a weird transition. But honestly, I, I credit my time in the United States for helping me grow up, if that makes sense, right? Um, in my 20s, I was very focused on my career, my future, um, and then my eyes were opened just living inside that environment, right, where there weren't programs to support people. Um, there were lots of people who were making really hard decisions between how do I feed my family or go to get, you know, go seek medical care because I don't have insurance, right? Um, and then so, I mean, I give the United States credit for why I became a nurse. So then becoming a nurse and just learning and that the, the amazing part about being a registered nurse is that you are, you're with people in their most vulnerable state, right? So you hear the stories, you actually hear their concerns. Um, and yes, inside obviously the hospital environment, I'm able to provide that support short term, right? Um, but it just became so apparent there are these larger issues, um, systems that are broken, um, supports that just aren't enough anymore or that aren't responding to our current environment, right? So, and this was all before the pandemic hit, right? <laughs> so, and I, I feel like, and I certainly can't speak for everyone, but the pandemic changed things, right? We, I know I certainly, like, or myself, my partner, we certainly took a look at our lives and said, okay, so we don't need that stuff, that's fine. But all this, these other things are coming up that we are suddenly seeing so much more value in. And so when coming back to your question, Chris, but about why is it the Alberta NDP, our values are the same. We, we wanna create a, a tomorrow that is supportive of Albertans, where Albertans want to not only come, or other people want to come to Alberta, but also those of us who are here want to stay, want to raise families, um, you know, go through our school system, learn amazing skills and stay. It's, I worry that with uh, kind of the way that Alberta is going currently, that we're not going to see that, that we're going to see a huge brain drain on Alberta, right? If we're not educating, if our education systems aren't being properly funded, let alone, well, created, right, if our curriculum is not appropriate. Um, I just worry that Alberta is becoming a province that isn't sought after. Um, and that is a big change for Alberta, right? Like growing up next door, Saskatchewan is always like the joke was is that people left Saskatoon and moved to Calgary. That's what you did. You went to the big city, right? <laughs> like that's what we did. And that's not what's happening right now, right? Um, for a number of reasons, which obviously we can discuss at length, but yeah. for me, I just felt the Alberta NDP, their values resonated with mine. Horror fans unite. The cross-border interviews with Chris Brown is pleased to offer a free audible copy of David Mercer's newest book, Living Death, A Love Story. The book is about Nick, who having suffered the horrible loss of his wife, plays the hero and rescues Jenny from her abusive boyfriend. Deciding that he has one last adventure in him, he invites her on a cross-country road trip. Little did they know that the world, as they knew it, was ending. Visit crossborderinterviews.ca to enter into the draw. Simply tell us your favorite horror film by April 14th and be entered. 
I was, uh, you kept on mentioning the other province that you lived in in the NDP. I was like, okay, which one is it? Is it BC? Is it Saskatchewan? And then you said Saskatoon. I was like, okay, I now know where she's from. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's my apology, my bad for not doing that and now not asking that question off the bat. But now that we've uh, uh, addressed it, there we are. Um, and that, to be honest, a lot of people from Calgary are currently from other provinces. I'm from Ontario. My husband's not even from Canada. So Calgary is that opportunity, that place for opportunity. So here we are. Um, I'll, uh, Calgary, Katie, let, let's talk mm -hmm. about the riding now. We were 15 minutes in and now let's talk about the, the riding that you are running to represent. Um, there are many issues provincially that are going on that are affecting the day-to-day -day lives of people at in all of Alberta, not just Calgary, Acadia. But what are the issues that you're hearing? What are you hearing at the door when you're at their door knocking, talking about talking to your uh, potential new constituency when if elected in 2023? What are you hearing? Well, what are the issues that they're telling you about? So we hear a lot of the common ones, right? So um, the curriculum is a big one. When we discuss uh, education, there's a, there's a number of educators I have met um, both through calls and door knocking, um, and they're concerned about the curriculum. They're concerned about the age appropriateness of it. They're concerned that their students aren't going to have successful lives past it, right? Um, and then, of course, in consideration of their own children. Um, so that curriculum piece is, a, is big. Um, I'm also hearing a lot about cost of living, right? It seems every 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 day there's something else that's more expensive than it was yesterday. Um, and they're struggling, not necessarily to make ends meet. Fortunately, um, many have over the course of the pandemic, you know, they've limited their, their spending, they've been proactive, um, which of course is great for them, but if not everyone had that opportunity. Um, the big one that I guess isn't particularly surprising and that it is Calgary Acadia is that um, I've heard stories of uh, the current uh, MLA. Back Which we will talk here. about a lot about in a few minutes, but anyway, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, but it's the concern <laughs> about the, or the lack of representation, right? Where they feel that, or what I've heard is that, um, you know, back in the day, there was door knocking. They had actually engaged in conversation with him and, um, but heard, heard nothing since, right? There's, there hasn't been a lot of, um, well, activity inside the writing. There hasn't been a touch point in there. And um, so in addition to that, and obviously uh, the kind of ongoing drama that's going on, they're, they're not happy with their current representation. Uh, and something that I try to kind of reinforce with them is that even, even if um, they're not NDP supporters, right? Because of course I get that at the door uh, where the answer might be, okay, thanks, but bye. Luckily I haven't yet encountered anyone who's been unfriendly, um, but we have had some, you know, we're, we're not, we're conservative, bye. Um, if I have the chance, of course, say, oh, that's, that's fine. Can you tell me what your issues are though? Because I don't, again, the job I'm going for is not to represent simply the NDP, right? That's not, that's not the job, that's not the role of an MLA. So of course I want to connect with every single resident in Calgary Acadia. And so um, a lot of times when I ask about, you know, what, what are your concerns? We can still find shared values. And even if at the, at the end of the conversation, they're telling me, you know, I really don't like our current MLA. I asked them quite bluntly, okay, so we've had this conversation, right? We, we know we have shared values here. If it's this person who you've already, you know, has demonstrated they're not sufficient for you, right? They haven't done what they need to do for you. And it's against me. And yes, I might be, you know, with a party that you don't 100% support, would you consider voting for me? And the answer is yes, there's no hesitation. So I, I feel that yeah, the concerns, I think that that representation piece, that transparent communication piece, the active listening piece um, is super concerning, especially when we look forward to how do we affect change? How, where do we go from here in Alberta? And if their voices aren't being heard, yeah, it's really frustrating. Okay, so there's a lot to unpack with what you just said there. Um, and it sounds like you've listened to the show before, so you know what the line of questions are going to be about representation. So we'll leave that off for a few seconds here. 
let's start with the curriculum. You talked about when you're you know, door knocking and uh, you're hearing at the door about the curriculum and uh, the uh, just successful for their children, being successful for their children. Um, yeah. If the NDP get into power in 2023, if they're re-elected, or elected, I should say, to government, it's a weird it's a comment. You can't say re-elected, <laughs> but you can say re-elected. It's weird. But anyway, here we are. If they're elected in 2023, Rachel Notley has said we would throw out this draft curriculum that the province has uh, put forward uh, and sort of go back to the drawing board. Um, this curriculum has been an ongoing issue. It seems like it just does not want to get created. Um, mm -hmm. Would you advocate? How would you advocate to make it a better draft curriculum to test drive in our, uh, our school system that would allow parents to give the input that I've heard, I'm assuming you've heard at the door, that they didn't feel like they got during this UCP draft curriculum rewrite? I think it, there are, so just given that this curriculum as presented it has so much um, everyone has an opinion on it. And I think it's important that we hear those opinions. And so absolutely the NDP, the Alberta NDP, you know, we're promising to scrap it, create new. Now in doing so, we're not going to do so just out of, you know, thin air. We're obviously going to consult with, you know, experts in the field, meaning those childhood development experts, right? People who are actually in the know about the best practices currently for that group. And I never want to classify, or I never want to group together all, um, you know, our, our grade school education through high school. These are very different developmental stages and we do need to pull in experts to speak to it. Part of pulling in experts is pulling in those parents, right? Engaging those parents with, okay, so this is what the experts say we should do. This is an idea that we've come up from it. This has been shown in other provinces, countries, whatever, as being uh, very, um, I guess, useful, development, developmentally appropriate um, portion of our education system. What do you think, right? Uh, because of course it's not, it's, <laughs> the curriculum is not an easy fix for sure. Um, we can't, it's not going to be one solution fits all. Right, we can't. We're not going to say we're going to teach math this way. As I'm just, I'm just guessing, Chris, that you are also of the generation where this um, new math, you know, be prior to new math, whatever that is these days, right? Like we had our multiplication tables. We had our, right. Um, You're know, you are officially making me feel old. Like no, there's no tomorrow. <laughs> I, yeah, no, I mean, new math is not that old, if that makes sense. Um, but, but I think it's appropriate, like when we think about, um, or my understanding of when this new math came in, whatever its actual title is, the idea of it was to, or part of the idea was to be more inclusive of other learners, right? We had that very standardized, this is how you learn math curriculum that we both went through, but it left people out, right? It didn't, it it appealed very much to the analytical people, but for students who maybe weren't, didn't think that way, right? They were more of creative or whatever the case might be. Um, they brought in this, this other way of looking at it. Now, do I agree that they should keep one or the other? And you know, I'm not gonna get into that, but just to illustrate that they, we need to consider a diverse group of students, right? And so we need to, cons we need to be able to bring in experts, including parents, including current teachers, right, um, to actually discuss it, right? Let's put the work in ahead of trying to roll something out that's half-baked. I feel like that's not going to be useful for our students or our province. You, you talked about our province and I'm just I'm just I'm just for cautious of time I'm just trying to make sure that we get uh, I get all my questions in and we don't stick to one topic for a long time as much as I would love to it's just it would be I just want to be cautious of your time because I know you want to get a door knocking today and my time and just because I have another interview after this but um we you talked about the drive to Calgary, the people who want to come to Calgary, like your, like the Saskatoon example that you talked about, people want to leave their cities and get to the big city of Calgary for the opportunity. You talked about how it might not be there today because maybe it might be oil prices, might be other factors as well. How do we change that? How do we get that? How do we get Calgary to be that 
beacon that it once was back in the 80s and 90s. And I feel like I'm really dating myself when I could tell. I remember my family members were around the table in the 80s and 90s saying, you move out to Alberta, you get a great life. You, you, even if you're there only for five years, you can come back and you have a great found, uh, f- uh, financial state uh, situation. Now I, I, I'm in that boat. I can say when I was looking for a job, I decided where should I go? And Alberta was one of my top priorities. Um, how do we change that? How, how do we get back that sort of, and I hate to use the, 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 the cliche words, but the Alberta mm-hmm. advantage. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think, I mean, obviously it's a complex question, right? So I think one way that, that we do that is we, we need our economy to recover. Right. And I'd say that most of the world needs our, their economy, our economy to recover. Um, however, I think one thing that we can do that would draw people again back to the province is just is re-diversifying our economy. Right. Our uh, we've been reliant on oil and gas since the 1940s. Right. Where, um, yes, we get the we, you know, we get the benefits of when the oil prices are high, like we're seeing right now. But of course, we're all very familiar of the times when oil prices aren't right very high, um, it, it's it's a non-renewable resource. Like I don't know if it's just because from growing up in Saskatchewan, being like this non-renewable, it will run out. <laughs> like we, this is not forever. Um, and I'm certainly not saying get rid of oil and gas. We need them. This is not. This is our our province has a resource. We just need to use it appropriately. Right. We need to diversify so that we're not at the whim of the oil market. We need to create other industries inside Calgary, inside Alberta that draw people here, right? Um, and that's part of that is just by offering you know, tax rebates potentially, or maybe it's you, we host conferences again, right? Where we draw them here. Um, but in order to do that, we need to address things even like if you think about Calgary, our downtown core is kind of a ghost town these days, right? I, I'm just looking at a map and I just because I, I, I'm trying to re- remember how far Calgary Acadia actually goes into the downtown core and it doesn't uh, like go right into like the down the deep downtown core but it does touch the downtown area like the Beltline yep. area. Um, yep. We are seeing high vacancy rates in that area and I'm assuming and the, correct me if I'm wrong here Diana but I'm assuming residents from Calgary Acadia work downtown. I'm assuming residents from Calgary Acadia are looking for jobs downtown because it's close to them. They can hop on a train and they can get downtown. Um, The high vacancy rate in the downtown has probably got to be a big concern for the residents of Calgary Acadia because it does drive up property taxes when people aren't actually using office buildings. Um, You talked about diversification. I apologize for interrupting. and I do not want to be accused of interrupting uh, somebody, but... um, you talked about diversification. What type of diversification would you like to see? It could be as simple as bring back, um, like, so trade shows, right? So it could be as simple as that. You're just drawing people to Calgary, right? Um, you're just by bringing people here again, right? We're jump starting the economy just by them physically being here, right? Making connections. And I, I feel like we've got, we have the space, right? We've got we've got a beautiful telecenter. We've got some some beautiful spaces that we could rent out that we at we can incentivize these different groups to come, right? Um, but part of that is that we have to make it safe, right? We have to prove that we have control over the current pandemic, right? That we have uh, things in place to so that we can so that we don't become a super spreader event if in fact we were tracking. For instance, right? We don't want people to come come to Alberta and get sick. That's that's not that's not what we want, right? Yeah. Um, but I do feel like we could just there are some easy initiatives to encourage groups to come here. Encourage one, you'll get another, and so on, right? Make it a positive experience. Bring in local businesses. Bring in local talent, right? Just to actually support these different um, activities as they come in. Uh, when I think about even like the film industry. Right, we do we do some filming right still in in Alberta. Um, we've done filming in Calgary before, uh, but in the last number of years, we've seen some of those um, incentives go away. Right, um, and so instead of coming here, 
they'll go to Vancouver. If ever we are less like <laughs> we have, we should be cheaper than Vancouver. We just should be. And yet somehow we're not in, in some cases, right? So I feel that we need to put back in place some of the incentives we've had before under, well, under the NDP government. Um, and we need to look at new solutions too. This isn't the same world it was even in 2019, right? We need to, we need to go where people are, not where we think they are, if that makes sense. Um, for transparency's sake, I just want to put this out on the table. I think you've just won over my husband. So as the former minister of tourism and culture who was in, who involved in the film industry in Alberta during the Alberta NDP time, when he listens to this interview, he will probably call you and say, go for it, girl. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> um, I, I want to talk about the, mil, the, the elephant in the room. And we talked about it earlier on, but I want to get, I want to dive deep into this one. And that is representation. You, you answered it a bit beforehand, but if you are the NDP candidate, you will be going up against, and I want to get this right here in uh, chronological order, the former Minister of Health, the former Minister of Labor and Immigration, the now sitting Attorney General of the Province of Alberta, Tyler Shandro. Yes. Now, when I, I did my uh, pre-interview with my husband, just to make sure I got all my uh, ducks in a row, he goes, uh, what does she do? And I said, well, she's a nurse. And the first thing he says is, well, Shandro's up Creek without a paddle. Um, <laughs> because of your background, is there a sort of a, a sort of a spark in your body that says, I need to, I need to defeat this guy because of what, him and Jason Kenney did during the start of the pandemic? I would say that, I mean, to answer completely honesty, honestly, of course, right? Um, we were, Alberta's registered nurses were in negotiations for our current or for now ratified contract before the pandemic, right? Um, there were like to the point where there were some very strong conversations happening. We were not agreeing. Um, traditionally, AHS has uh, been very clear that they are not, that it's not the government that's, that's negotiating with us, that it's AHS. This round, they were very clearly saying, the government is saying this and we're backing off, um, which is not the way those are supposed to be negotiated. It's not, it's an interesting um, situation that we were put in because we were suddenly, instead of, negotiating with our directly with our employer, suddenly it became a provincial government thing, which I mean, not naive to think that that's not normally involved. It's just, this was a very transparently involved. Um, so then yes, of course, with, uh, you know, Minister Chandro being that face at that time, yeah, there was some definite concerns and the decisions being made, um, I personally felt were not coming from a healthcare perspective. Right? We were not, we were in, you know, hopefully the only pandemic of our life, our lifetimes. And there is, and, and no offense to lawyers, my partner's a lawyer, my, my father's a lawyer, there's lots of lawyers in my life, but their, potentially their perspective is not the same as those of us who were frontline, right? Um, and so uh, the, the, kind of continuous fighting if it was with the nurses or with the physicians or now with all the other uh, healthcare workers, it appears, um, in year three of a pandemic, uh, yeah, uh, there's definitely still some frustration there, we'll say, right? So absolutely. Way to use the political word there, Jay. <laughs> but um, I mean, nothing against, nothing against him, right? Nothing against, it's, it's not, at the end of the day, Chris, right, I, I am about representing the people of Calgary, Acadia. Yes, I'm a registered nurse. So absolutely, I come with, that is, the, those are my values. Those are my concerns, right? I, I advocate and support for my patients. And I'll tell you when I'm door knocking or I'm calling, what I tell the, my different residents is, I'm here. My goal is to advocate and support you. That is, that's what I'm doing. I'm transferring those skills over. And I think getting back to who they currently is representing them, that piece sounds like it's being missed, right? They're, they don't feel represented. 
We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15 second soundbite by becoming a backer of the show. With a quick visit to patreon.com and searching cross-border interviews, you can help continue this show. For as little as $3 a month, your support can ensure we grow and bring new and exciting things to our growing listenership. Click the link in the show notes and back the show today. So you you you've mentioned that prior to getting involved in politics, you reached out to former uh, family members who were in politics themselves. Mm-hmm. FYI, I will be asking that question after the interview is done of who they were. Uh, but you you must know that being the, the being a, the role of an MLA is quite difficult, especially when you live in the, the city outside of the city where the legislature sits. And add on that a cabinet minister's job. Now, you you try to be in your writing as much as possible, but Edmonton is the draw because that's where the ledge sits. Um, so I'm not trying to say what Tyler Shandero has done over the last two years because I'm not in Calgary, Acadia, so I don't know on the ground. So he might be extremely busy. And I know there was a pandemic as Minister of Health, you took the lead. But as a actual MLA, you are there to represent your constituency. So how are you going to do it differently under the guise of understanding that you you are elected to represent Calgary, but you're going to be working in Edmonton, the majority, not the majority of the time for a large period of time. And then if you are appointed to cabinet, then you're really going to be outside your riding. So how do you do that for you? Not for Tyler Shandro, but how will you do that? And how will you ensure that your constituents' voices aren't forgotten and you the next person who runs against you if you win they don't hear the same thing that you've just told me about Tyler Shandro of we never see him there's no voice how do we get our voice so how would you do that so continue doing what I'm doing right now first of all um, which is that I'm engaging so I mean speaking with the members of Calgary Acadia is a priority for me even now right um I am super fortunate that the current, we actually just had our AGM for Calgary Acadia for Alberta NDP CA. Um, and there are amazing people already in place, right? Um, we have some, some seasoned um, individuals who've been there. Uh, they were you know, there in 2015, they were there in 2019, they're there today, um, super engaged, uh, very motivated. Uh, so I've got that group and they're, we have the same goal, right? Um, And then, of course, all the other amazing volunteers on top of that. So, of course, I'm going to lean on them, right, in terms of, you know, what are you hearing? What's going on? Uh, This issue has come, you know, what what are the feelings inside the writing on that when I'm away? But, of course, there's always like... like we're doing this call from, you know, from wherever you are, Chris, right? I'm sorry, I don't even know where you are. Northeast Calgary. Oh, there you go. (laughs) Whitehorn. Woo. I shouldn't say that out loud. We're not exactly (laughs) that far from each other, but... You know, we know the pandemic has shown us that we can still have connection even if we're we're not physically together. So I'd continue responding to emails, sending them out, social media, Zoom calls, all of those things, right? Um, and then in addition, when I actually am in Calgary, to be very strategic about attending or organizing events where I do have the opportunity to interact directly with my writing, right? Um, and this would be, and again, yes, it's going to take a little bit um, of effort on both parts, right? That here are the events I'm going to, please let me know, uh, you know, please attend. And if you can't, let me know what your concerns are. Um, I, I truly value that transparent, open communication. Um, absolutely, I'm not always going to my decisions that, I'm, that I make aren't going to make everyone happy. Like that's, that's just, it, you can't please everyone, but I am 100% open to discussing why that decision was made and be transparent about what's going on around it. Because I think at the end of the day, that's all we could really ask for is, okay, we went this way. Why did we go that way, right? I wanted to go this way. You wanted to go that way. What's the deal? And I think just those conversations to make sure people are informed um, and hopefully we can walk away agreeing to disagree sometimes, right? (laughs) You bring up a good subject, and I want to get your your thoughts on it. And you, you mentioned a little bit in that, that statement that you just made there, and that is 
representing everyone and we've talked about it a little bit at the beginning of the interview but i want to get i want to dive a little bit more in detail because i think if people are listening to this they want to know that who they're electing is going to represent their values and who they believe is the best person to do that now as the potential next mla for calgary acadia you will have to represent a very diverse amount of views I'm assuming if you door knock on your street right now, you would hear a hundred different things from a hundred different people and a hundred different ways on a certain subject. How do you do that? How do you represent a diverse viewpoint that is Alberta politics? Because what I believe in Alberta NDP is, is completely different from what you might think it is. So how would you represent not only your party, but the people that are there to re elect you to better move the province forward in a way that is beneficial to everyone when people might not see it as being beneficial to them because they don't believe what you're doing is right. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so that's an easy question, uh, Chris, I think. So, to totally, um, totally. To well, the next one's going to be easier. Don't um, worry. <laughs> um, honestly, when I when I think about, so if I, if I, phrase that question in the context of okay say you know um you know the alberta ndp were successful uh, in 2023 we form government fantastic in the first 100 days you can imagine we're going to have a lot of things on our plate what i can say short term to those I, I would be representing from calgary acadia is that it's a bit of a triage and what i mean by that and yes it's it's tossed back to my nursing but it is the these are the issues that are already happening, right? These are the things we know are moving forward or changing. How do I best slot in the needs and, uh, well, and concerns from my writing into those different ones that are going on, right? How do I have those verses heard? And that would be, of course, working together with whoever, with policy building amendments, whatever it is, right? So that's that first, you know, here's our 100 days. This is what our priority is going to be is pushing through. How do I best pull all of our needs from Calgary Kitty into it? Now, after that, right <laughs> after, you know, maybe there's a little bit more. I mean, I can't imagine Alberta politics hasn't exactly been um, snooze fest recently. Right. So it's always so. Has what? Not been, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what? I, I, I did not know that. I've been just like oblivious about what's going on these days. <laughs> right. You're like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Um, but when, if things settle down in terms of how do I represent everyone, it's part of that is the touch points, right? Is hearing, right? Is hearing the concerns, is making those, um, those actual, like facilitating, facilitating that conversation, right? So if it means, uh, like I'm open to having Zoom calls, I'm open to having town halls, I'm open to having all those things, because I think it's really important that your representative, like whoever you elect, actually represents you. So um, it would just be that continuous engagement. And then again, that transparency piece, because I do feel that, yes, we might have one issue going on. This is this is the most important thing for Calgary Acadia. Let's say we somehow, you know, it rose to the top. If it fell into, um, like, again, triage again, that 911 situation, right? Say we don't have food for our seniors. For instance, I, I'm. This is not. This is not what I'm saying. But if yeah. this were the case, um, then yes, to me that is a. It, it's a. Uh, a matter of uh, short-term survival, right? This is a 911. We need to do something about it right now. Um, and even outside, necessarily, you know, the provincial politics, it would be get involved with the city, right? Get involved with our city councilor. Get involved with the local, um, well, supports, right? To be able to stop gap that that concern right now and then be able to bring that up when it's when we're able because obviously politics doesn't move at the same rate as maybe we need it to right um and for good reason we do need to make informed decisions right we need to collaborate and and have discourse over it so that we're making the right decision for all albertans but um i mean i, I know there's no perfect answer for this it's just what i can say is that i would do my best to both facilitate the conversation, right? Seek that information in various forms because not everyone wants to have a conversation with me, right? And that's okay. I don't know. <laughs> um, it brings up the the second the second last question in this uh, conversation, and that is representing your constituents versus representing what you believe. 
Ah. Now, you are there to represent the people that have elected you. But I know, and I believe you know, and anyone who's ever been a politician knows, politicians have brains. Weird concept for some people, but um, <laughs> they do have thoughts and minds of their own, and they do have opinions on certain subjects. Now, let's talk about that engagement. You have that engagement, and you hear overwhelmingly, and let's be honest, those who do engage with politicians are usually... The, in the political realm are usually very hyper hyperly active or very hyperly opposed to the person. But if you hear from your constituents when you're door knocking, when you're actually holding these town halls, that they want you to vote a certain way on a certain issue. And it's the overwhelming majority. But in the heart of hearts, you believe that you should be voting for the subject and not against it. And I don't know what that is, but let's just, let's just put it on the table like a, a, an issue. How would you handle that type of situation? Because I know, uh, I, I want my, rep my elected representative to be their own voice, but I want them to do their best job to represent who I am. So I know where I would fall on this situation, but for you, how do you balance the needs of your constituents and the needs of what you need to do and what you believe is right to do? So, as a registered nurse, this is the one, so this, this I have, so the idea of representing or advocating and supporting um, something that I don't 100% agree on is not new, right? Um, as obviously as a registered nurse, I advocate for my patients, right? And what my patients desires are, my patients needs are. Um, am I involved in the conversation about what are your needs, right? Um, you know, what are your options, that education piece? 100%. Right. But at the end of the day, when I am, uh, even if I don't agree with what my patient wants to happen, that is still my role. I still advocate for them. Right. Um, provide them with all that information, et cetera, so that they can make an informed choice for themselves. So I am not um, unseasoned in representing potentially um, positions where I don't feel um, as strongly or I might strongly feel a different way. Uh, so I've done it before. I understand the role, right? I understand that honestly, when I, Calgary Acadia, if they you know, give me the opportunity to represent them, that is what I'm doing, okay? That being said, I still, I mean, I'm still, I'm running with the Alberta NDP. So my values, right? When I, I value people, I value, um, it's, <sighs> I value a society that supports each other. And so I wouldn't want it to be surprising for anyone to be like, oh, well, she, she supports this thing that, I mean, I don't know what it is, whatever yeah. it is, right? Um, I don't think that would be surprising. Um, but again, if it came down to Calgary Acadia says, this is like somehow they all unite and say, this is my issue. And I go, I don't even know. Okay, that's still my job, right? Yeah. I still will advocate for them. Will I definitely have a conversation and, and try to seek more clarity on it and provide maybe information so that they understand it maybe from my point of view as well? Absolutely. But at the end of the day, my job is still to represent them. Um, with, with no nomination date set for your potential nomination, uh, if I'm not mistaken, in the last time I checked, and for full transparency, who's listening to this, this is, was recorded in... Uh, the last uh, week of uh, March, but it's airing in the second week of uh, April. So we're taking a week off in uh, the first week of April. For anyone who has watched this, you know that we've taken the week off. Uh, and this airs airing the week of the fourth. Um, with no nomination de date set as of when we're recording this, how can people help out? How can people get involved? How can people learn a little bit more? Because even if the nomination meeting is called Sunday morning for 30 days, you'd still have to be, uh, the, there's a, still a nomination period. How can people get involved? How can people learn more? Because we've talked for 40 minutes and I guarantee you there's someone yelling at their radio on the Deerfoot or someone watching this on YouTube yeah. and saying, why didn't you ask that question? Well, it's my show and I ask the questions. Um, so how can people get involved? How can people reach out and learn more? And how can people in Calgary, Acadia, potentially reach out to you and say, hey, I want to have a conversation. I want to have a Zoom interview with you. Love it. Love it. So easy way to find me. And I know you'll, you'll share all my social media goodness. <laughs> um, 
but an easy way to find me on my Twitter and Instagram handle is my is D I A N A B A T T E N underscore. Um, so you can find me on either of those inside. There's a link to my website there. And of course my website has a link for becoming an NDP member, um, has a bunch of information about me, of course, and a contact, right? So I would love, like, this is, you know, when I, and I know Chris, you're going to ask, like, you had a message for everyone and I'm kind of taking your, your line and I apologize, <laughs> but I, I, I do, I want the members of Calgary Cata to know, I want to hear from them. Right. I want you to become engaged. And even if that's a send me an email and say, you know, these are my issues or you said this and I want to know more. Um, I'm so appreciative. I, you know, door knocking. Uh, I have the opportunity, of course, to speak to people who are home. But if they're not home, we leave a flyer, right, just like a little flyer in their in their mailbox. And I am so delighted every time about two days after we go door knocking, I get these emails and just residents having questions questions about me questions about the party questions about everything like it's it's i i love it i love to hear it i am very much a detail details person uh so and i want to hear their concerns i want them to ask me their questions so yeah so you, you kind of stole my last question so as a, as an interviewer i'm going oh, now i have to ask a repeat never having heard of the show uh, again yeah exactly <laughs> now oh. Um, we are a year away. Uh, my, uh, our good friend up in uh, Dave Berta podcast, well, former Dave Berta podcast, uh, came on the show and he talked about the red zone. We are in the red zone. We are in a election season. Um, you have a large job ahead of you. Uh, defeating a minister is hard, but uh, defeating one like Tyler Shandro might not be as hard, but it could still be hard. But you still have to work like it's a hard uphill battle. Why you? Why should you? And this this is my favorite part because then this is this is if you actually have listened to the show and you're ready for this question. But why should Diana Batters be the next? Well, first off, why should Diana Batters be the next Alberta NDP candidate and MLA for Calgary Acadia? Take your time whenever you're ready. You got as much time as you need to answer that question. Go for it. I like it. So um, I would say I bring, so Alberta needs an experienced set of leaders. They do. We need, we need leadership. We need proactive initiatives. Uh, we need experienced member, experienced representation who are okay, both, both showing accountability. Hey, I misstepped here's the corrections, right? We all do it, we're human. Um, and I think that needs to be an expectation, right? Um, we need people who are open to discourse, right? Who, are, who actually want to hear all sides of the story and to make an informed decision, right? Um, and I feel that both in terms of, you know, as I, I mentioned briefly there, so before I became a registered nurse, I was a scientist. I literally sat in rooms on a daily basis and had these very, uh, we'll say, heated discussions about many things, right? Theoretical things. And then in nursing, it was a little bit more focused, right? Where, again, it was that learning how to advocate for someone when maybe you don't quite agree with what they want you to advocate for. But again, at the end of the day, my job is to, well, as a registered nurse, is to advocate and support for my patients. Uh, so what I'm, of course, asking and looking to do is to take that same experience, to bring my perspective, which I think is lacking in our current government, right? Uh, to bring that perspective, to bring, to bring that passion um, and that desire to affect positive change to our provincial government. So that's why, why me. Um, I have it. I have the drive. I have the knowledge. And I have the humility, which I realize sounds bizarre when you say you have the humility, but uh, but I do, I, I know I don't know everything, right? I, not a chance, but I know to seek out support, right? And I've, I've been doing that throughout this entire, you know, my, my uh, campaigning as it goes. Uh, I reach out to people if I don't know the answer and I get back to them with it. I think it's, it's that I am a bit of an open book that way, right? If you ask me a question, I will give you an honest answer. And I, I think that's very refreshing. Um, so yeah, that's why you should support me. 
and why I want to be your next MLA. Um, Diana, <laughs> I want to thank you for doing this. This has been an uh, enlightening episode. I wish you all the best uh, heading thank into you. the nomination and to the, into the next year. Um, once elected, I will have you back on. So if elected, I should say, if you're elected, I will have you back on to talk Perfect. about uh, the politics of uh, Calgary Acadia, but also life as an MP, uh, MLA. Wow, I'm getting everything. <laughs> My next interview is with an MP. That's why I got that mixed up. I apologize. Um, but I am, I am honored to have you on the show. I wish you the best in your nomination. I wish you the best going forward. Um, for those who have listened to the show before, you know what I'm about to say. Uh, the links to Diana's uh, website, social media, show notes. So scroll down. If you're watching this on YouTube, there's all the show notes. Click, go to her pages, follow her, send her a message if you wish. Also, if you're listening to this on any of the uh, uh, podcast platforms, if you're listening to this on the car radio and you want to learn more, pull over before you use your phone, please. And then actually uh, check out the information. But uh, once you're home, check out the information. Highly recommend it. Um, uh, Diana, thank you so much for doing this. Thanks so much, Chris. This has been so much fun. Uh, you know, a couple of curveballs there. It's appreciated. <laughs> hey, I can't give you all the answers, all the questions before we start. I was going to say all the answers, but I did not give you like, any yeah, of the, the answers. Answer. Um, for so uh, my last parting uh, words before we do wrap up here is uh remember everyone this saturday uh august uh, august april 9th we are going to be live covering the alberta ucp showdown in red deer battle so please tune in live via youtube as we bring in some pundits like we did for the fort mcmurray by-election and we're going to be talking about what's going on and what does this mean for the future of our province so with that uh, Diana, thank you so much and have yourself an excellent rest of your day, guys. And remember, get it from behind Twitter, have a conversation with somebody and actually just talk. It helps our democracy. It helps our society and helps our community be better. So with that, I'm Chris Brown from the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Talk to you later.